Thanks for the patience uh, for for being the first session of the of the seminars. It's not going so bad. I think that, that at least like we can transmit things and so on and so forth. So it's my pleasure to introduce the the second speaker of today's seminar and actually one of the other alma mater of this uh, of the celebration of this seminar, who is Alvaro Marín. So Alvaro is a physicist from the University of Sevilla. Later he did a PhD in fluid mechanics in, in the same university. He went for a postdoc and twenty uh, where he stayed for three years, right? 20. Well, uh, I, don't I don't know how, how to pronounce, pronounce uh, Dutch or, or German, so that's why I'm saying now that he's now at this university in Germany, in Munich. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know how to pronounce either, but uh, that's the university. And you have been there for about one year, right? Almost, almost two years, right? So, and, well, so he's going to talk about the evaporation and suspension of, uh, of droplets. Okay. So, Alvaro, please. Well, thanks a lot, Javi. It's really an honor to be here. Um, so yes, as, as I said, I didn't study here in Madrid. Um, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of new here. Um, and I actually know all these guys, all these people from the conferences. So when we get uh, together abroad and all that. So uh, one of the reasons to meet here was not only to have beers and talk about physics, as, as he explained, it was also to see their work. Because in these conferences that we go, there are like 20 parallel sessions, so we never get the chance to see each other's presentation. So that one idea was to get together at least here in Madrid and then, and then so that share all these uh, different things that we do. And I think it's a very nice idea for the seminar because I think we cover really, really many, many aspects of fluid mechanics. Uh, on, so we have from, from beer physics to atmospheric physics, uh, coffee physics that I'm going to tell you about now, and many other things. So what I'm going to tell you about is the stuff that I've been doing for the last years. It's, it's, it's not anymore my main topic, but I'm still involved in this. And it's about uh, what I like to, to talk and also worry in uh, fluid mechanics problems, evaporation of droplets. So if you think about it, I mean, okay, yeah, you have a droplet in your table and it's evaporating and then it's gone. I mean, there's really nothing interesting in principle on that. So therefore I call it in principle boring. And this is what many people thought until, until a group of people in Chicago started to study this. So this is a coffee stain, what we call a coffee stain. It's just uh, when you leave a drop of, of a suspension like coffee in your, in the, in your table, it evaporates, it evaporates, and then when, then you, when you look again at it, it doesn't have, it doesn't have so you don't see an homogeneous stain, stain, but you see but only, only like, like color in the sides of the, of the, of the stain, stain, no? So this is what they call a ring shape stain, a coffee stain. And it's kind of interesting because in principle you wouldn't expect anything to happen inside, inside a drop of water evaporating, but actually there are many things going on. So, I want to spend some time telling you about this effect, and it's, this is a paper that these people in Chicago studied. And the thing of the evaporation of drops is that mainly chemical engineers uh, worry about this type of trouble. They always thought thermodynamics was involved. They thought always thought that it was a very complicated problem involving chemistry and involving uh, thermodynamics. And so there had to be people from the James Frank Institute. Uh, this was the Institute of Leo Kadanov, still, still active. So half of them are mathematicians. And these were the guys who finally found the way that this, this, this model, these things work. So under this unfortunate name, uh, basically I can translate into better English. It's saying, OK, uh, ring stains from dry liquid drops are caused by capillary flows. This is, what, this is the main idea of, the, of this paper. It's an only three-page paper. And um, right now, right at now, the date of today, it has more than 2,500 2, citations. citations. You see, so you the see, paper so was the published in 1997, and it has an exponentially growth of, of, citations. of citations. So, so it's a really, 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 it became, it became, became an explosion. An explosion. So, so once these people, these people understood this problem, problem these mathematicians this understood this problem that was a domain into chemistry, the research into this has gone crazy, and it still is growing. I mean, this I took this data at the beginning of the year, and I guess it's still guess growing, it's growing really, really fast. Really fast. The, reason the reason is because, because once the people could understand this problem, they could apply to many, 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 many different many fields that you cannot imagine, not only chemistry. The chemistry is only one part. So of course you can imagine, for example, if you have a drops drying, this is something that happens quite often in inkjet printing. When you have a drop of ink uh, drying in a, in a substrate, so what you want is to have it homogeneous. You don't want a spot with a, I mean, you know, the dot of the eye, I and mean, you want it to be homogeneous. You don't want 
a gradient, a gradient of, of, intensity of intensity there. This is one this example. Is one example. Another, of Another of my favorite, favorite examples of application is, for example, this one. These are two different drops of blood. blood. The first one is for a, for a healthy patient, and the other one is for a sick patient. So this is another interesting example. Just analyzing what type of patterns do you get into this type of suspension, you can actually predict, and you could, in principle, the idea is that you could actually tell which disease has this patient only looking at the, at the stain of the, of, of the drop. No? It's a very interesting idea. And of course, you have a lot of, if we're talking about suspensions, um, you can actually make colloidal crystals, for example, as, as, as you see there. So you just let the drop evaporate, and then you get the particles arranged in a certain manner. And this is really, really interesting for optical properties and many, many other things. So the interesting thing is that these guys took just a sample of their daily life, explaining well, and then this cross explosion in the, in the, in the field of fluid mechanics. You know? And other, other, because I mean, uh, Langmuir, for example, is a classical journal for chemical engineers, for example. You know? So um, I'll spend a, just, just a few slides to explain you what uh, the, the genius idea of these guys. In principle, the idea is what the, these guys started saying, okay, let's start from the most simple idea that we can think of uh, this problem. No? So let's forget about thermodynamics. Everything is a thermal equilibrium. You have a fluid, a volume of fluid, which is evaporating in a, in a medium. There is no flow, everything is quasi-static, nothing special, okay? So it's a really simple idea in, in principle. So if the droplet is evaporating normally, it would do something like this, no? It starts big and then becomes small, and that's it. And then there is an important part of this droplet, which is the contact of the liquid with the solid. This is what we call the contact line. And this is really important part in all this that I'm going to tell you. If the, the, the surface is perfectly uh, flat and, and, and there's nothing there in the, there, just the contact line will just move, you know, I mean, the, the droplet will just move, and then we will come smaller and smaller and nothing will happen. And then the contact line will move, like you see it here in this arrow, and, and then there will be no coffee stain in this case. What they found out, one of the things they found out is that actually, um, because you have particles accumulating there, right there at the contact line, uh, they, say they say that the contact, contact line is thin, thin, they say. So the contact line cannot move, actually. So then the evaporation doesn't occur like in a spherical way, let's say. Well, the surface of the drop is always spherical, so it has a minimum surface always. It occurs in that other way, which is a bit more peculiar, actually. No? And then the idea was, okay, if this evaporates like that, and you want to maintain um, like the minimum surface, because, I mean, you have surface tension that is... That is trying to keep your, your, your surface minimum. If you want to do that, then the only way to do that is to send liquid towards the contact line so that you can keep the shape. And therefore they call it capillary flow because actually it's surface tension, which is just in order to keep the shape of the, of the dropper, is it's sending fluid there so that you can keep the shape. So this was the, the initial idea and the first mechanism that they, that they thought. And then it, there's much more much more into this. So in principle, you can think of the problem just as, uh, as I said, no, no temperature involved. Everything is a uh, thermal equilibrium. And then the only idea is that you have uh, your doppler here, and then you have uh, like saturated vapor close to the surface, and then unsaturated vapor really far away in the infinity. Okay. So it's just a purely diffusive equation, a purely diffusive problem. Nothing else than that. So in principle, it's really, really simple. So you just have the concentration of vapor, the C, and then you have the evaporation rate, J, that will go from the surface, from the surface of the droplet into infinity. As simple as that. So the genius idea of them is that that's the only things that you need to describe the whole problem, actually. Of course, once you get into it, it gets complicated. I will tell you how. So one way the, to think about it also, and it's really interesting, is to think this as a to think about this as an electrical problem, actually. So if you think of C not as a, a concentration of vapor, but as a voltage, and then J will become then the, the electrical field, then you have, I mean, we're all, I think, spend more time in, in electromagnetism than in, than in this type of other problem, so it's easier to think about it. And then the droplet will be a conductor, okay? But then there's a tricky part in this, if you think about this. 
If you have, you have, you have this, this, just, just if you want to solve it like an electrical problem, you will have to do the mirror image also to have symmetry. So, and then you will have here uh, a point in which you have a corner there. And you know what happens in a corner in a conductor under an electrical field? Yes, I mean, that's why I love you, man. So, so you have a singularity in the corner. So this is the same effect that you have, what, I mean, if you have a tip in the, um, and you have a, um, a storm, how you call this, the, um, I don't know in English how you say, uh, how you call that, even in Spanish I forgot already. So, I mean, you have a point, a metallic point, and then you always have discharges, electrical discharges there. And this happens because you have a singularity in the electrical field there. The voltage is constant, you don't have a singularity in the voltage, but you have a, a, a singular electrical field there. And these guys found out, of course, that you have exactly the same thing there. So, if you solve the problem close to the, close to the contact line, the contact line forms like a tip there. Okay, so then, actually the dropper is not evaporating homogeneously all over the surface. So you have a minimum evaporation at the center of the drop and a singularity in the evaporation rate at the contact line, which is at the same time also dragging fluid from there. So it's a really interesting idea that, that kind of was, uh, I don't know, no one took much care of it. So then you could, they, could, they could calculate really, really easily solving this, just this elegant equation for the, for the evaporation rate. And then you see perfectly uh, this takes uh, lambda takes negative values for most of the cases. And then you have a singularity in the, when you get to the, to when minus R comes to uh, capital R. And the interesting thing is that this is actually really, really general. So this type of singularities, not only you have them in electromagnetism, you have them in evaporating drops, and you have them also if you're baking potatoes in your oven, for example. So you have a, you put just a potato there, and then you will see always that the corners of the, of the potato that you cut become much more brown, or they become toasted much, much faster. And this is just, again, a matter of faster evaporation at, the, at these corners. This is a beautiful paper of Lisa Bivoquet in the American Journal of Physics describing this, this effect and solving this problem in, in two dimensions, let's say, in this case. Beautiful paper. Um, but not only that, so I talk about evaporation. Well, well, you can treat it as, as a diffusive problem, as I told you. But if you think about it, if you, now you invert the, the physics and you have condensation, in principle, this will work the same. I mean, so if you have condensation towards the tip, and then you will have a preferential condensation into this part. And this is actually also something that we did also for fun with people in Twente, with pointy droplets that I want to explain how they are formed. But, it's, but it's the idea is that you have a super cool tip, and then some te uh, temperature is like minus 20 in the in the tip, and then you start to grow a Christmas tree directly, preferentially from the tip. So you have ice condensation preferentially from the tip. So this is like the inverted case of what we're seeing here, evaporation. So you have evapor evaporation in both these cases, and also condensation preferentially in the tip also. So, it's, I mean, I find it fascinating that you have this simple idea that is actually applying to electromagnetism, evaporation, condensation, and many, many other cases that you could, that you could think of. No? So, this was the, the, the idea that they had. Therefore, they got so many, so many interests in this problem. And I actually bumped into this problem just playing one day in the lab, uh, as many other things, and just looking at this, uh, Casually. So the, the experiment that I did it was really simple. So you have, a, again, a droplet of water with some particles on it, and then we look, I look from the microscope below simultaneously, as I see from the side. So maybe you don't have much contrast. There are droplets here. You see them here. And they're already starting to form what we call the, 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 the stain there. No? You see there. And then I just did some, some easy PAV measurements on the uh, particles. There are, Right now, you only see the Brownian motion. We're looking more or less at this area there. And then I'm plotting here the radial component of the velocity here in this, in this plot. So you don't see here clearly, but this is zero here. You see, they're almost really not moving towards the contact line. And this puzzled me a bit at the beginning because I said, okay, I mean, I was there waiting for 20 minutes, waiting to see the famous coffee stain effect. Although you see particles here, but I mean, they're moving really slow. And only at the end of the process, when the dropper is already almost not a drop anymore, but basically merely a fill, then, then the particles started to move like crazy. You can see that clearly and also in the measurements. So it was like an explosion 
right at the end. Therefore, we call it the rush hour effect because it seems that, that all the particles just move. Just wait until that time, the moment that the, there will be no droppers anymore, just to go there. Right? When you go to the theater, no, and then, I mean, if you go half an hour early, you will find a spot to park your car, but if you go five minutes, uh, this is when everybody wants to come, especially, I guess, here in Spain. So, this was really weird. Uh, in principle, we didn't, I didn't understand, we didn't understand that well. Once you look into the equations, actually, the, and we look at the whole model of Deegan and all these people, we found out that actually it's, it's, it's a relatively simple idea, and, and it's, it was not as surprising as we thought in the beginning. So actually the idea is that um, the amount of liquid that is being dragged out of the, of the contact line, it turns out that to be almost constant in time. Okay. So I'm confused now with the evaporation rate. I'm talking just the amount of liquid that is being suck out, out of the of the contact line actually at the, the very end is almost constant in time but our droplet, droplet is becoming thinner, becoming thinner and thinner and thinner, and thinner. And thinner. so you have so a flow rate, rate that you have to you give, give to the contact line feed to the contact, to the contact line, line but your droplet but is becoming thinner, thinner and thinner, thinner. thinner so the only way to maintain this this flow rate is just increasing the velocity and the velocity increases exponentially so it's just mass conservation actually so okay Man, we thought it was a fancy it's effect and it's mass conservation again. Mass conservation, mass conservation again, man. Yeah, always to, 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 to fuck other things, things, no? But then we found out something interesting, right actually. Right if you see here the stain, you see really, really bright here. And really, really different in the other side, right? So it turns out that it's, this was actually quite interesting part. So this is accelerated really a lot. So the, what happens there is that at the beginning, the particles are really going so, so slow. They, are, they have time to find a nice parking slot, you know, and then very order, you know, first line, second line, third line. And then those coming at the very end, they just leave the car, you know, whatever they find. You know? So completely randomly. And this surprisingly is a really, really sharp transition, which was, this was something really, really surprising, which we didn't expect. So here you can see it better. So you see here, you have really, really order. You actually have different crystalline order phases, but we will come to that later. And then suddenly, bam, there is a break. Maybe here you still see some crystalline phases, but it's not, maybe not the best case. But I mean, it was just a case where you can see it clearly. It's much more sharp in, in, in other experiments, actually. But the thing is that then we can take the videos, even from the, from the measurements, find at which moment we don't we see don't this, see this, this order array, array anymore, anymore, and then calculate then actually the critical velocity, velocity that, 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 that is needed, needed to, have, to create this random, random phase, OK? Then the idea behind this, I mean, uh, it's actually really simple to explain. I mean, we thought we follow the same approach as usual, no? OK, let's go to the simplest thing that we can think of to explain this, this phenomenon, OK? So the particles are actually uh, having some Brownian motion, OK? So they are kind of diffusing, the, they have a, their own diffusion themselves, no? So they have a time scale for this random motion that they're following. And this is kind of the, the typical time scale that they will take to find a spot if, if they're just moving around, OK? So we call this time, this time scale the TD. Okay. okay, but then you have then the you convective have time scale. scale. Okay, the, the fluid is moving and it's dragging the particles. Okay, and then, then we just call this U that is has this this singularity in, in time, and then the typical length the length, length, length scale of, of is this is actually interparticle distance L. Okay, and then we thought, okay, then this critical behavior will happen when just these two values, these two time scales will come will come together, right? I mean, it's. In principle, this naive idea we should, should work out, no? So then if you plot uh, the velocity, the critical velocity that you will get if you equate these two time scales, and then the measure uh, one, you get a one by one relationship really nicely for uh, like, uh, this was like three types of particles going ranging from 0.1 micron, one micron, two microns, and five microns. So let's say in the range in which you have, and you can have um, these two time scales get together. Of course, if you go to really small particles, the running motion will be too strong, and then they will even don't care about the, the velocities that you are. Right? So in this range, this it, these are the range where you will see this transition. And it, this naive idea turned out to work perfectly to, to explain this phenomenon. So, um, Okay, this was okay, this nice. nice. I mean, we could see this explain how is the ordering in this in these coffee stains and all that. 
But actually, actually there was there much was more, more in this. In this. So, so if you, you notice, notice that actually not order, order, order to disorder, disorder transitions, transition, but also order, order to order, order transition. I don't know if you can look at this well. Uh, in the order phase, very close to the contact line, you have an area where you have a like hexagonal uh, array of particles. Then suddenly you go to the next layer of particles, and then you have a, a square uh, arrangement. And then again you have another hexagonal. So we thought at the beginning, well, I mean, this is something fancy involving chemistry. You know, when you don't understand something in fluid mechanics, you blame the chemistry. I mean, uh, so say, so, yeah, there's some chemistry involved. Yeah, we don't understand. That. And then someone pointed out this, this beautiful paper of, of Pavel Pieranski in the, that is actually still active in, in Paris. In Paris. Um, this guy made the, the following experiment. It was really beautiful. So he took a wedge. Okay, he took two. I have nothing to do with evaporation or anything like that. Okay. So forget, forget about this, about Pavel Piransky, 80s, 80s Paris, Paris, okay? okay. Um, um, he took a wedge, wedge like a, uh, something making a corner, corner, and then he put then he really big particles, like one millimeter like one particles there. Particle. No? So, so he was a bit of obsessed obsess with uh, how, how those particles, particles um, um, pack in confinement. Okay? okay, so he put like a wedge, a corner there, he put a lot of particles, and then check it. Okay, and then see how the particles are arranged there. And he found a really, really beautiful thing is that for really low angles, when you have a high confinement, this one millimeter metallic walls, uh, in the first layer that they have a space, so you have space to have one layer of particles, they arrange the best way to pack particles in this sense is hexagonal packing, right? So that is the best way to have them, no? So you have a first layer with this. Then the wedge increases size, so they have a bit more space. Uh, but still, they don't, they don't, don't have, have a space, space to get a second, a second hexagonal, hexagonal layer. layer. Okay? okay. But what but he what found out is that actually particles, particles can, can ha you can have you a can second have layer of particles if you pack them in a, in a like a, a square, square array, array actually. actually. So actually, actually you can actually do the experiment. I didn't bring a ping pong ball, but you can do the experiment with ping pong balls, and you find out that in a square array, maybe in the in the say in the x y dimension, they are not packed so very well. But in the vertical direction, they actually occupy less less height. So then, in this second layer, where where they still don't have a space to pack a hexagonally, they can do it with a square array. And then once you go a bit farther away, then you have more space, and then you can have a again the hexagonal the hexagonal array. And then, and then we, we see here, see here uh, like two uh, transitions, transitions, but in his but case, in case, I mean, he saw like saw six, six types of transitions. Type of transition. So from so hexagonal to square, to, square, to, uh, to hexagonal again, again, square again, and so on. And so on. Like six or seven transitions. This, this was a series of papers that he wrote really, really beautifully. And with a sim really simple model, just calculating the volume that, that the particles uh, occupy, you can, you can describe this perfectly. And it's really beautiful that, I mean, he was never seen with colloids. And actually, you know, I mean, it's really nice to see that. This one micron colloid with polymer and, and, and some fancy cover at the end behave the same as one millimeter balls. No? So this is really this was really nice to see. Okay, so this okay, so was this nice. nice. Uh, this is nice. They work with coffee stains. It's a fairly simple experiment. But actually, what people want is to not to have them. I mean, as I mentioned, for example, if you have inject printing, I mean, what you want is to avoid this. This. I mean, you want the the stain to be homogeneously distributed, so you have an homogeneous uh, ink, for example, in the, the dot of the eye. No? So this was actually with people, with a group of, of uh, also other people in Twente, uh, Frieden Mugele, well, they do some something called electroweighting, which is basically just, you have a droplet and then you apply some voltage and then the, you get the droplet crazy, okay? So whenever you go to a seminar and, and, and they see what you're doing, the, their question is, what if you apply an electric field to that? No? So this is the, the question. They always, they always have these this questions at the seminars. No? And actually, they came to me and asked me this question. What if you apply an electric field to an evaporating drop? So I just could only guess, but I guess, OK, what you will have is just that your contact line will move, right? So if you remember, one of the conditions that I told you to have this coffee stain is that the contact line must be thin. I told you at the beginning, right? So the contact line must be like blocked and then not move, and then you will have this fancy evaporation type where, where you send the particles to the to the contact line. If you do this electroweighting, you will turn the contact line crazy, and then the contact line will be free to move again, and then you will avoid the the coffee stain exactly. just just by doing this. So this was one 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 way to do that. Another way to avoid coffee stains it was also um, in nature. Actually, this ended one week before we sent our paper to nature, and. <laughs> 
Uh, they found a way also to avoid it. It's just uh, playing with the uh, with the shape of the particles that you're putting in your into your suspension. It's a bit more complicated to explain, but basically the particles are soft at the surface and then they avoid the staying like that. A bit more, a bit more sophisticated. Not so, not so fancy for my taste. So, but then look, thinking into that, we had another idea. Okay, okay, we we can do this with evaporating drops uh, in a glass. Okay. But if we want to really avoid that in a simple way, we could actually use something that is called super hydrophobic surfaces. So normally we're using glass, which is hydrophilic, okay? And then when a gas is hydrophilic, then it wets, you have a low contact angle, and, and then the contact line pins easily and all that. In a super hydrophobic substrate, your droplet is like almost as if it's floating in the air, okay? Because the contact with the solid is, is really, is that's almost no contact with the solid. The solid is made of, of pillars, and so it's like a, we call it Fakir uh, drops, because it's like, a, it's like going on pillars, okay, the droplet. So, and then these surfaces normally have the, the situation that the contact line is not pinned at all. I mean, you cannot pin that, because there's almost no solid underneath the droplet, okay? It's almost like floating in the air. So, just naively, we tried this. This is actually a video from, from the National Public Radio in the in US. There's actually a guy talking, but... Oh, that's good. So you see the pillars here? This is a droplet. Um, and then it's just a bunch of particles inside, and then we just leave it evaporating. I mean, in principle, it was just a naive idea, okay, to avoid this coffee stain and then have all the particles concentrated in one single spot. The result was much, much more surprising than we initially expected. So you had droplet evaporating, and then at some point, well, this is not the end of the video. The video is still running, okay? So at some point we just saw this, okay, okay. And I mean, I just expected just a, you know, a pile of particles and, and that's it. But what we saw was that. So then we took this, this surface like that. So this, the scale is like um, less than 100 microns, like 50 microns, something like that. Then we took it to the, to the, um, to a scanning, micro, to the SEM, okay, to the scanning microscope. And then what we saw is actually that. This is a top view of, of what is there. So it's an spherical, Macro cluster of, of particles. And it's perfectly spher spherical. I mean, you see the shape perfectly here. These are the pillars that I told you at the beginning, so the droplet was sitting there. So if you don't believe me, this is a bit of a side view, so we tilted a bit, still keeping the shape. And if you come even closer, you can see actually these are the breaches of the, of the, of the liquid how, as it's detaching from the, from the micro pillars, okay? And you see the scale here. So these are like uh, the pillars are 10 microns, 15 microns, something like that. And then something also really interesting also is that the, you see the patches? So we call these soccer, micro soccer balls, actually, because you have like uh, patches on the surface, like crystalline patches on the sur covering the surface. So you see one, pla one patch here, another here, another here. So it reminds me always to the pentagons in the soccer ball. So I said it for fun with Delef, and then he kept calling it micro soccer balls forever, uh, even in the paper. So yeah, what can I do? So. Um, and then, I mean, the surprising thing is that they are all really, okay, it's not much contrast, but I mean, you have a very perfectly, like, hexagonal array of particles in this, in this thing. And then, we thought, okay, I mean, can we make them even smaller then? I mean, so then the idea to make them smaller, since we're doing all this at atmospheric pressure and room temperature, so it's just putting less particles in your droplet, okay? So reduce the density of particles in the droplet and see if, if we can reduce the, the amount of um, the size of these balls, no? Even further. And then it turned out that, yeah, we could make it smaller, but we could not make them as crystalline as, as, as the initial one. And this was really surprising. So these are the, the balls that I just showed you. This is another one, just reducing the, the amount, so it's still pretty much crystalline. But then the smaller ones, you see here the surface, it's, it's, it looks completely random, no? I mean, the particles don't show any, any order whatsoever. And we were a bit puzzled about that. So I, I, I will tell you a bit more conclusion uh, about this. I mean, why the crystallization of the, of the particles depends on the amount of particles that you put in, which m doesn't make sense to me in principle at all, no? So if you plot the, so I just measure the, with the microscope, the, the size of the ball uh, relative to the particle size, and all the dots follow more or less what we expect, no? So the, it's a relationship like uh, one to the third, okay? So the cubic square root, no? Because it's, it's the occupier volume, so you have a volume. And then the red line here is what you would expect 
if the particles were always packed perfectly, meaning the maximum packing size that, that, that they could have. And what is that? This is actually a really, really, really old problem that even already uh, Napoleon already has solved already to pack his cannonballs, okay? So this is a problem that uh, actually there is a bit, um, so what is the best way to pack particles? We all know nowadays that it's hexagonal packing, okay? But in those days it was Kepler actually who, who, who made the calculation and found out that the best way to pack this is that one. And then in, if we, um, we have a way to measure that, it's called the packing fraction, okay? So is the, if you have a volume, uh, volume V, okay, and then you start to put particles in, and then you can calculate the volume occupied by the particles, and the ratio of this, of the volume occupied by the particles, by the total volume that you have, is the packing fraction. It's how efficiently you are putting particles there. So if the particles were, or if you have a, a, cube, a cube, and your particles are cubical, you, will, you could get a one packing fraction, but if you have a, another random volume, and then you start to put spherical particles, you will get another another value, whatever, whatever, no? So it's been demonstrated that for spherical particles, no matter the, the, the volume that you have, the best, the maximum packing pressure that you can achieve is 74%, okay? And this was already Kepler who, who, who found this out, okay? So um, this is the plot, that uh, the red line that I, that I showed you before. This is the maximum packing fraction that you can have. Other question is, I mean, why does this packing fraction depends on the, on the number of particles, I mean, because it's, it's something that we didn't understand. We could calculate, actually, the packing fraction in our balls, because we know the, the total volume, and I can I know more the amount of particles that I'm putting in. And then, this was a surprising thing also, no? I mean, you see that you have for, this is the amount of particles, just number of particles. So if you, we seems to have, seem to have a critical number below which we have random arrangement, and above this you have perfectly, almost crystalline arrangement. Just, just what I've been talking about. 74, uh, 64, sorry, percent is what you have if you, if you have a, a random arrangement. So you don't have hexagonal packing, but you just pack them very well and completely statistical randomness, okay? And then you get a 64%. So this means actually that in these cases, we are not, not only random, I mean, below random packing. This means that we have probably even uh, void vacuums in between, no? We have air pockets there in between, no? Which still doesn't make sense to me, no? So then, okay, let's, let's, let's think a bit stronger now, you know what I mean, uh, about this. What's going on here? So we, first, let's see, because the, the dynamics of the, of the evaporation here is a bit different than what that you saw in the, in the other case, no? Here we have a droplet that is almost like floating in the air and it's, and it's evaporating homogeneously. So uh, if you have a di purely diffusive process, uh, the radius of the droplet will go like a square root of time, okay? And this is actually really, really important in this process. So if you have a droplet evaporating like that and, and you calculate the volume, uh, sorry, the radius of the drop, you see that the, at the beginning it's relatively slow. You have a almost constant slope. And then at the end, it's actually accelerating. And you, will actually, you could actually notice this in the video. And this is just because of this square root. Because the radius, the derivative of the radius in time actually diverges when the radius become, comes to zero. You know? So the, the dynamics come up much, much faster at the end of the process of the evaporating uh, thing. No? So you can think about it actually uh, about like the rush hour effect in a way. It's completely different physics, no? I mean, here is just because of the of the way the droplet is evaporating and and, 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 and that's all. But you can think about it in a, in a similar way. So um, it's actually then if you think about it, then we have a slow dynamics at the beginning, and then things become much faster at the end. But then I mean, if you don't put any particle, then the droplet of course will reach radius zero, but if you put particles, the radius will never reach that radius because, you know, at some point, you have a, uh, the volume is determined by the amount of particles that you put. If you put a lot of particles, you will always remain in the slow dynamics area. But if you put less particles, then you will be able to reach a smaller ball size and you will, be, you will reach the fast dynamics region. And that was actually the key point of, uh, of, the, of the problem. So if you analyze um, this to get a, a number for the number of particles, then you have, we have, a, again, a competitive process in which you have diff diffusion versus convective processes. No? So you have the particle diffusion dynamic scale that we defined already before, like that. And then you have the convective time scale that in this case is not, this is not the velocity of the particles due to evaporation, it's just the, the, the velocity of the interface colliding, let's say, uh, collapsing into, into, the, into the center. 
So then we can calculate, actually, we can do the same naive uh, uh, argument, like, okay, there will be a critical radius when these two guys will come together. And then if this radius is, is, uh, is really large, then, then you will get these other balls, and if not, you got other balls. I mean, it's something as naive and simple like that. And then from this, we can relatively easily calculate then a critical number of particles, which in Transcendent Lab, I mean, it's not a universal number. Of course, I mean, we're evaporating at room temperature, uh, atmospheric pressure, so the speed is normally always the same, regardless the the size of the of the balls and everything. But it depends on the diffusivities, on the diffusivity of the particle and the diffusivity of the vapor in the in these conditions. So this number will depend, of course, on how are we evaporating the droplets. Okay, and then if we go <coughs> to the plot that I showed you before, again you get this that we fairly can obtain more or less. I mean, of course. The data is a bit, uh, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of error because we're calculating microscopic uh, features from, from microscopic uh, measurements, but uh, still, I mean, we, we got more or less the, the, the transition fairly, fairly good. And it's with something as simple as, as convective versus diffusive time scales, something as simple as that. So, um, yeah, actually, that's, that was all that I, I wanted to tell you today. The message to get home is that actually, I mean, yeah, I mean, as, 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 as Javi said, I mean, you can think of just having a beer with your friends and you can have really good ideas. In this other case, I mean, I think this, the key thing here is that you have simple problems or apparently simple problems, but sometimes you have to think a bit out of the box to solve them, like these guys. I mean, this was a, a classical problem in chemical engineering and then some mathematicians have to go there and have a stupid idea that actually turned out to be to work wonderfully. And this trigger now a whole field. I mean, there are millions, millions suspended in this in this field now. And just became just for a simple idea. Well, well two mathematicians were having a coffee. So um, yeah, with this, I would like to finish and thank uh, the people that have worked with me in in Twente, in Holland. So this was Hanneke Helderman, which make all the papers with me, and then uh, her Professor Lose and Jag Professor Jakas Nuyer, also from the University. Of and that's all. Thanks, guys. So. Okay, thank you very much, Alvaro. Uh, questions? Ah. So, yes, yes, one curiosity. Do you know if there is liquid trapped inside the Ball packets For or looking at it in these microscopes, in this scanning microphone, you have you need to put vacuum. So if there was any, it was gone for the moment we took okay. the pictures. Yeah, I mean I still have them. I mean with me, and it's been now two years we made those experiments. So and they're still there. Yeah. Uh, and another question: What is the biggest size of these balls that you can reach? The, of the total ball? Or the, so yeah, I the mean, total. Yeah, ball. you can make them as as big as you want. Uh, as if you put, keep increasing the number of particles, it will keep growing. Then maybe you will lose the, the spherical shape, mm. probably. But yeah, in principle. So you, you our, our question was actually how, how if, uh, the minimum number of particles that we can put. That was our question. Yeah, yeah. But what, what I'm saying is that you could think on that as a way of generating a push media where sure. you have a. Yeah, yeah, because I mean. If you can make it as big as possible, that I don't know if it's really possible. Maybe you are really limited. Really limited I mean, they already use this type of techniques for, for, um, for making porous systems, ah, but okay. in, a, in enclosed systems. So you have like two, sl two glass slides mm -hmm. with a suspension inside. Then you have a, a dry in front, yeah. and then you have, you're making a porous system in a way. And they, they use it already. So they, they use the, kinds, the same kind of reasoning to, to get the porosity and the final property? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, if there you have less movement even because you have it confined, much more confined than in these cases. And yeah, then you have a different, different problems. You have uh, uh, cracks and you have other type of instabilities in the crystal mm -hmm. and that you can use actually crystallography to study these, these cracks. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is uh, many years in, it's been okay. studied, yeah. yeah I, uh, yeah, yeah, no, but I mean, it's a good point. I mean, <laughs> for assistance, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, 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 microphone, man. Sorry, man. You're online, man. The world, the world is watching you, so it better be a good question. Okay. No, so uh, simply, the, the, you call them soccer balls because they look like soccer balls. Yeah. Um, 
uh, when they are ordered, no, when they have exceptional order. Yeah. Why, why, where does this pattern come from, actually, this bigger yeah. pattern? I didn't have time. So the idea is that, um, well, this was my guess, but it turned out, I think it turned out, uh, no? Okay, maybe you can see here, but I'll tell you. It's basically the idea is that um, you have particles being absorbed, I mean, like, absorbed more or less at the surface sometimes, you know? And then they want to become crystalline. And then when they will make a crystalline and a crystal, a proper crystal is flat, okay? It's not a spherical. If you have a spherical one, then it's really difficult to get more layers of, of particles all there, no? So they want to become flat. But then you have the problem that the droplet is not flat, okay? It has a curved surface. So at some point, this crystalline patch has to break and create another patch, okay? So depending on the, on the size of the ball, you will have patches of different of typical size. And then if you use, just do some easy similar uh, trigonometry calculation, you can actually get the typical size of these patches, which is about 50 microns in this case. And it pretty much goes with the scale of, of the patches that we see. And I think it's, this is the, the, the answer for that. Yeah. Nice. Thanks. So let's uh, thank the, the speaker again. So um, I guess we could have like a 15-minute break. So because I guess that we will have to switch uh, laptops again and all that. So if you guys uh, want to take 15 minutes, also in, in your homes, so uh, we'll be back like by 12 or something, 12:55 or something like that. Okay.